Yeah, thanks very much to Julie Snorick for that introduction, and to her and to Lisa Weinman and the other members of the Board of Directors of the Wyndham World Affairs Council for arranging this, and I'm, yeah, I'm delighted as a new part-time resident in Brattleboro, I'm delighted to be able to, to do this and to, to participate with this very important community organization. So, uh, yeah, moving right along, I'd like to, uh, to give some context uh, to Mexican community forests, which uh, may, may sound like an obscure subject to, to many of you, but uh, to understand uh, its significance uh, globally, uh, let me just start by you know, giving a quick overview of global forest, uh, you know, where and, and what are they? <clears throat> so tropical forests are actually the single largest forest type in the world. And if you yeah, look at the map there, you can see down in South America, it's, that's the Amazon basin and some associated forest. Uh, in Africa, that's you know, Central Africa, West Africa, and the, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is very important there. And then over to Asia, that's Southeast Asia, Myanmar, and down into Indonesia are most of the tropical forests of the world. But then getting back to South America here, I want to call your attention, uh, yeah, up north of South America, Central America, and if you know your geography at all, you'll see southern Mexico there, and up the coasts is, uh, is, most, is the, where the tropical forests are in Mexico. Now, the other major forest types are the northern forest, boreal forest, 27%, temperate forest, which are the ones we know here best in Vermont at 16%, and subtropical forests like southeastern United States, China, some other areas. So uh, moving right along to forest and climate change, which is what a subject I, I want to spend some time on later. Uh, it's important to know that forests act as both sources and sinks for carbon dioxide, for CO2, which of course is the greenhouse gas which is warming up the atmosphere. And so standing growing forests uh, absorb CO2 from the environment. They, as they photosynthesize, they're bringing the CO2 into the, into the solids of the tree. Uh, and about, you know about 50 percent of, uh, of, of forest and any any kind of plant is carbon uh, and uh, so but then when you cut down a forest and you burn it which is what has frequently been done historically because people just want the soil underneath the trees they want to get rid of those trees so they can plant stuff uh, you know to feed their families and to feed the world and so when you cut down a forest and you burn it, all that stored CO2 goes up into the atmosphere. And then when you have young regrowing forests, uh, they're recapturing carbon from, from the atmosphere. Now, uh, this will be significant later. Let me just mention that there's, you know, there's been a lot of research and discussion. So do mature forests capture much carbon? They're already very large trees. They may not be growing that much. Current research suggests that mature forests do still capture significant amounts of, of new carbon, but young growing forests uh, capture, uh, capture more. So, uh, so yeah, one of the major ways that carbon is emitted from forests is through deforestation, and uh, you see different numbers on this uh, from different methodologies, but uh, one current estimate is about 20% of all total carbon emissions uh, come from deforestation and forest degradation, <coughs> which is more than the entire transportation sector. Uh, most deforestation takes place in the tropics. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the Brazilian Amazon, so that's 41%. Uh, the dark blue uh, is actually Colombia. I don't know why it's further down on the list, the orange is Indonesia, uh, the gray is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, and it, it, but it's important to mention, you know, we always hear about deforestation, it it's, it's, continues to be a serious problem. But forest recovery is also happening. There's a lot of forest regeneration, 
There's a lot of rural urban migration in the tropics, partic particularly in Latin America. And as people leave rural areas, they're abandoning agriculture. And forests grow back. Forests have this great trick. If you, you, know, if you leave them alone and the conditions are right, they will grow back. And so it's important to be clear that it's just not, all, in the world today, it's just not all linear trends of, of deforestation. There's also forest recovery. And of course, here, if you, I'm guessing most of you know something about the forest history of New England, Vermont. Mm -hmm. And Vermont has gone through several historical cycles of this, of deforestation and forest recovery. And so those similar processes are happening in some other parts of the world. It's not, it's not all deforestation. Okay, so what, was, what, what should we do about deforestation and forest degradation? One of the most common responses is, well, you know, we need to protect forests. We need to put them in protected areas. And this is a favorite strategy, a favorite response of many eco ecologists and conservationists. And so they say that, yeah, I mean, the, the problem with deforestation is people. People are cutting down forests, and so you have to have strict protected areas that keep people out entirely. Uh, and so you know, this is the only way you can protect forests. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature, that keeps track of these things. So there's been a lot of progress. So the, map, the map shows where they're distributed uh, globally. The green is, is terrestrial, and the blue is marine and coastal protected areas. So, yeah, with over, since 2010, over 22 million square kilometers and 28 million square kilometers of ocean, 42% uh, of, so there's been a wave of new uh, protection recently, 42% just in the last decades. But there's still, you know, many important, highly biodiverse areas which are, are not covered by protected areas, and it's less than 8%, I think that number is actually a little less, but that says 8% of land is both protected and connected. So it's very important that you have between protected areas that expands their utility if there's corridors between uh, protected areas. But the, the other problem with establishing strict protected areas where you're you know, trying to keep people out is that in most of the developing world, there's people <coughs> living in the highly biodiverse areas. And uh, certainly from my point of view, and but the other, that's, that, that's not a problem. Uh, because in many cases there is a strong association between the indigenous and local communities who have lived in these highly biodiverse areas for very long periods of time, sometimes hundreds of years, and the high biodiversity. They're doing something right. And there's, there's usually low population densities. Uh, they're not engaged in intensive agriculture. And so you can see the numbers there, estimate that indigenous peoples, 4% of the world's population, occupying 22% of the Earth's surface, and that that includes some 80% of the planet, planet's remaining biodiversity. That number is not clear the basis of that, but, there's, but there's, it's very high biodiversity. Okay, so one of the things you, that people want to do to protect the forest for climate change, for biodiversity, for lots of reasons, uh, besides protected areas. Well, the other thing we should do, obviously, right, is plant trees. And if you paid any attention at all, you've probably heard about some of these, you know, there's many initiatives, because planting trees sounds like a great idea, right? Who can, who can be against planting trees? And so there's all these different initiatives, and you've probably heard the uh, ads for a new a uh, credit card where they'll plant a tree every time you charge, right? And there's a, you know, yeah, here's, you know, plant a billion trees, three billion trees. Well, you know, it all, it all sounds great, but there's a serious problem with all these initiatives. Who, who takes care of the trees after they're planted? You can't just plant a tree in the ground and leave it, particularly if it's a young sapling. Uh, they're very vulnerable. Uh, to all sorts of things, to, to drought, to diseases, to fire, to wind. And so you have to have somebody who will take care of those trees over the long term to make sure that they grow up to be big, big trees. And can all these promises uh, be met? Uh, this I'm actually quoting myself here from a blog I did for the uh, Ecologic Development Fund at Cambridge Mass NGO where I'm on the 
board of directors. But uh, this is something I was just you know, talking about with, with Julie. You may also be aware, if you're paying any attention at all to some of these issues, that many large corporations are, you know, are committing to net zero carbon emissions by 20, usually by 2050. So that means to get to net zero carbon emissions, what that means is that they're, also, they're both going to reduce their emissions, but there's some emissions that, for whatever reason, can't be entirely eliminated. And so those are what is done, you know, what they deal, they deal with those through what is called offsetting. Offsetting is, you, there's a variety of ways to do it, but for these purposes, planting trees, so as the trees grow, uh, in principle, and these things can be measured, as the trees grow, they are sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So in principle, I can calculate that those emissions from a corporation that can't be reduced, can, that, that can be calculated and they can plant enough trees that as they grow, will offset those carbon emissions. So, sounds, sounds great in, uh, in principle. Uh, however, yeah, Ox, Oxfam has very helpfully added up all the total commitments from all these corporations for offsetting using trees and found that they would need an area five times bigger than India uh, to meet all of them. And a colleague of mine at the University of Minnesota, Forrest Fleischman, has noted, yeah, we'll need another planet. There's a limited amount of land that's available for storing more carbon through forestry. So, yeah, they're over-promising, and it's, it's not clear, you know, how these trees are going to be taken care of. Uh, so, recently, uh, this is an article in Science or Proceedings of the National Academy of Science just a few years ago, what are called natural climate solutions. And this is just a, really a rebranding of uh, responses to climate change, which have always been out there. So if you look at, you look at this, uh, so we're going to just look at yeah, protecting forest is obviously one of them, uh, protecting wetlands, protecting grasslands. But I want to get to this one, manage forestry better. Um, and I will be proposing here that indeed, well, you know, the, the other, okay, so these, these actual climate solutions, they don't really say, okay, how, again, how are you gonna protect forests? Who's gonna manage the forest? Who, who's gonna do all this? And in a lot of these proposals, it's not at all clear who are gonna be the agents who are gonna make this happen. Is it just, you know, abstract uh, natural climate solutions? So, Forrest Fleischman and others have proposed what are called, what they call people-centered natural climate solutions, that where it's made clear that there are communities, there are people who care in, in the specific area of tree planting, that there's people who care about these trees, who are going to depend upon these trees for their livelihoods or their children's livelihoods, and that uh, therefore they'll take care of them. Uh, and that's not that's not the case with a lot of these uh, tree planting uh, initiatives. There was just I was just there was just an article yesterday in an online magazine, Yale uh, Yale Environment 360, that that went in to many of the failures of large scale government tree planting programs in recent years. And there's a lot of details there. Very, Basically, very high mortality of the trees. You know, like some cases, like 90% of the planted trees died because nobody was taking care of them. So, just as one example, Brett local Brattleboro example, uh, associated with Wangari, Mathai associated with Brattleboro, her Green Belt movement, and you can see the details there, is, is a good example of a people centered natural climate solution. So, another one. Uh, is Mexico's community forest and uh, community forest enterprises. Uh, and this is based, as uh, Julie mentioned, on my uh, 2020 book of the same, of the same title. Uh, I did not arrange for the book uh, to be on sale here. Number one, it costs $50. Number two, it's very academic. I'm sorry, it's really not for a general audience. I'm, I'm sorry. But, uh, you can read a thousand word summary of it, uh, and then you don't have to read the book, uh, in a uh, website called The Conversation, uh, which, is, which is designed to allow academics 
uh, to get messages about the research out to general audiences. Again, if you just Google Bray the Conversation in Mexico, you can find that. And you can save yourself 50 dollars. Okay. So we're uh, Mexico. So now we're on Mexico in Mexican forest. So the purple is the tropical forest in Mexico. So this is the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, down through Tabasco and the Gulf Coast here, and in southern Mexico and along the coast. Uh, but Mexico also has has a lot of temperate forests uh, in the Sierra Madre Oriental, the Sierra Madre, the big mountain chains which run through Mexico. That those are these light greens. And that we have very extensive stands of uh, pine and, and pine oak forests, uh, almost all uh, inhabited by communities. And so there's, there's a lot of history here, which I won't go into, but it goes back to the Mexican Revolution. If you know any of your Mexican history, uh, the Mexican Revolution was in the second de decade of the 20th century. Uh, there was a sweeping agrarian reform that came out of that where land was redistributed to Campesino, the peasant families, and forest redistribution was not specifically what they had in mind, but they did end up in the process distributing lots of forest to local communities where, where they, over a historical process, uh, they became, communities became full owners of the forest on their land. So it was a historical process in 1940, 80% by 1980, and this is the current estimate, that 60% of all forests in Mexico are directly owned by local and indigenous communities. And so this is like the second highest or third highest in the world after Papua New Guinea and, and Colombia. Uh, so, and this continued to you know, fairly recent historical periods. The Mexican president Luis Echeverria in the early 70s uh, continued doing some large scale uh, forest and land distributions, including the breakup of a very large foreign corporation uh, holding of 261,000 hectares. That's over half a million acres, uh, which is still in, uh, this, this term of he though, I won't get into all this, but there's yeah, two different forms of agrarian communities in Mexico. One is this funny term, he though, the other one is, uh, is comunidades. And this is, this just is a, yeah, a graph that shows the historical, those are the, the different Mexican presidential periods and the forest and land distributions which took place. So what was, what was going on here? It was really a, a dialectical uh, action, if you will. There was really some top-down reformers in Mexican, the Grand Reform Agency, who really you know, wanted to see this happen and who thought that communities could manage their own forests. And then the communities, uh, you know, and the, particularly in this period, most of these communities were composed of you know, people with grade school educations at best, but they knew an opportunity when they saw one. If they had forest in their land and the government from above, these reformers were giving them some opportunities, they, they grabbed those opportunities. And this is a quote from uh, uh, a colleague of mine, that's actually him in the picture with the bushy hair uh, from the 1970s, but this is him writing in, the in 1992. He was involved in these government re reform efforts and uh, you can read it, a country of creating a country of silviculturalists, that's just the term for forest management, of forming community forest enterprises and democratizing the process of forest production. So this was a vision that Mexican reformers in the government had in the 1970s and the communities really, uh, really responded to. Uh, and so the tragedy of the commons uh, I'm, I'm guessing that a brown girl audience, many of you have heard the term tragedy of the commons, but actually little audience participation here. Can anybody explain what it is? Yes? If it's not mine, I, I want to get my share first. You want to get your share it's first? Uh -huh. We over, over graze or over use our Right, right, exactly. Yeah, you're referring to the, the, the notion of the tragedy of the commons came from a 1968 article in Science by a biologist named Garrett Hardin, and what he was positing was that you had, uh, you had let's say, let's say you had five sheep herders, and you, there was enough pasture there for, for uh, they each had five sheep, and there's enough pasture for 25 sheep. But he posited that these 
sheep herders were rational, non-communicating actors. That they were just each, you know, it was a market, a market assumption. They were non-communicating actors, and you know, putting their sheep out there. And so one of them thinks, well, you know, if I put six sheep out there, I can grab more of that pasture. Right? There's only enough pasture for 25 sheep. But if I put six sheep out there, I can grab more of the pasture uh, than the others do, and I can grow my sheep bigger, faster, and sell them for more money. But then, of course, the other rational, non-communicating sheep herders say, they see him doing this, and they say, well, I, I better put some more, some more sheep out there myself to grab more of the pasture. And then all the sheep herders end up doing this, putting way more sheep and overgrazing, as you said, and, uh, and that's, that's the tragedy of the commons, uh, that non-communicating actors will over-exploit a commons. So in the 1960s, it was used as an as a excuse, as a pretext, as why common properties which widely existed in the developing country should be dissolved for, in favor of private property. Uh, but I digress. What, so what uh, my intellectual guru, a woman named Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009, uh, sadly died in 2010, um, uh, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, despite being a woman, was the, the first woman or one of the very few women, uh, and it was also a political scientist, uh, who, because what she and her colleagues pointed out and documented and, and analyzed was that in the real world, communities are, are composed of people who communicate with each other and they take care of commons, and they set rules around the use of the commons. So if that one sheep herder, you know, if, you're, if the rule is you can only put five sheep out there, and one guy decides he's gonna put six, which will happen in any community, the community will put sanctions on it. And they will say, you gotta get your sheep off there entirely for two months, you know, you broke the rules. And that's what, you know, what they document, what she and many colleagues documented was that that's what happens in real world community commons. And so they set the rules, and in the Mexican case, these, these common property forests are managed for the commercial production of, of timber. So you have the Mexican forest common property regime, it said 60% of the forest in Mexico are owned and managed by communities as a result of a historical process. Uh, I'm going to focus in here in Oaxaca. We have data from the entire country, but some of the best data uh, that we have is from Oaxaca, where, I, where I've lived and worked for quite a few years now. It's 82% uh, percent, uh, owned and managed by communities. And if any of you can read Spanish, uh, you can see that that says, uh, in this community, private property does, is, does not exist. The buying and selling of communal lands is prohibited, prohibido. Attentively, the, the mayor of common property goods of Ixlan de Juarez, Oaxaca. This is in the Sierra, Juar Sierra Juarez of Oaxaca. And no, this is not communism at work, although uh, maybe in a sense, but what they're saying, this, is, this property uh, is owned by the entire community, there is no private property here, uh, and uh, yeah, that's true, the private, private property uh, does not exist, although it, are, they are market-oriented enterprises. Uh, so, uh, community forest enterprise, I'm not, I actually don't go into the whole enterprise thing here, uh, but both theoretically and empirically, this is very unusual where an, where an entire community, as a community, owns property together. Uh, you have remnants of these in New England, you know, the town commons here. Uh, these are, you know, practices that were imported from England. These are, these are just remnants of what in England was a similar, similar historically similar sorts of regimes. Um, so, yeah, currently in Mexico, some 1,600 communities with logging permits. Uh, over half of these, you know, and these are in all size ranges, uh, but around half of them operate sophisticated logging and processing equipment, heavily capitalized all the way up to sawmills and furniture factories. Uh, and so these, are, these, are, these are communities who 20, 30, 40 years ago, as, as I said, were 
composed of people with grade school educations, but because of the relative prosperity over the decades brought by the logging, uh, many of the, the community forest enterprises now operated by community members with professional degrees in business, forest, forest agronomist. Yes. So do the community members that own their own property outside of those forests? Uh, it, it, like inheritance and stuff like as the communities grow or something? Uh -huh, uh, it, 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 it varies a lot. Yeah, the question, uh, the question was, are, is there private property outside of these common property forests? It, it varies. There's different, there's different situations. But in, in particularly in, these, in the indigenous communities, no, a concept of private property doesn't exist, but within the community, yes, you have long-term use of an agricultural parcel. You can pass it on to your children, but it's all regulated within the community. And if you and your children leave, mm -hmm. the community can say, you know, no, that's not, you know, we're taking that land and we're going to give it to somebody else. Yeah. So as long as you're occupying and using it, it's yours. But it's, you know, the community still has ultimate ownership. Now, there's some other situations where uh, indeed there's a forest common and then there's, there's private property which you can, which you can buy and sell. Mm. Yeah. So it's got different, different situations. So what I want to get to uh, quickly here is uh, three different things that I'm going to suggest that you know, the common management is very successful, that they conserve biodiversity and forest cover, provide good paying jobs, and uh, help mitigation and adaptation uh, to climate change. Right, so the for managed forests, so uh, community forests in Mexico uh, manage around over 16 million acres. That's just the land, the forests that are directly under management. There's much more within some of these common properties because there's a lot of forest which is conserved. Uh, if uh, some of you may be familiar with the Forest Stewardship Council, uh, which, which if you've seen uh, this logo on any uh, wood products, it's, it's certified that these are well-managed, sustainably managed forests. And uh, there's almost 3 million acres within these forest communities which have uh, FSC certification. Uh, this was a study that was done by uh, Katrina Brandon, it's old, 2005. But what she was doing here, she worked at the time for a big conservation NGO. Uh, called Conservation International, and all these, these little blocks that you see around Mexico here, uh, and that's the Sierra Norte that the arrow is pointing to. She was actually trying to identify, okay, she said these are the areas in Mexico which have high biodiversity in birds, amphibians, and mammals, low human populations, and limited agriculture. What she was trying to do, she comes from a conservation orientation, it's one of these people I was referring to that just say you need to have protected areas where you keep people out. And so she was arguing that, okay, these are places that already have low human populations and limited agriculture. This is where we should put public protected areas. What she was not taking into account is that Sierra Norte is entirely community-owned lands. And you know, clearly one of the reasons why there's such high forest cover and high biodiversity there is because these communities have been well managing their forests for a very long time. Very high biodiversity. Uh, they're still discovering uh, new species in Sierra Norte all the time. This was you know, a tree frog that was just discovered uh, by a uh, colleague of my wife's in Oaxaca. Uh, and if a tree frog isn't charism charismatic enough for you, uh, they also, uh, we have identified and have camera trap photos of uh, jaguars in the community forest. So even large carnivores, large mammals like uh, jaguars are being protected. So this is just a yeah, brief uh, case study from the Sierra Norte of Oaxaca that was done by uh, a master student of mine. That's the full citation there. Uh, 23 communities, uh, all of whom were logging their forest uh, in, uh, in, Oaxaca, in the Sierra Norte of Oaxaca. They do logging cycles over 40 to 60 years. This gives, gives some, uh, I really need to wrap this up. Uh, recent logging area, uh, natural, and generally they don't even have to go out and reforest. They don't have to go out because they're just, they, they use particular silvicultural uh, practice where they, they log 
maybe one or two or three hectares at a time. So, you know, they're doing a, a big a patch, a fairly large patch, uh, taking out all the trees from that patch. But that's still small enough that the natural seed rain from the trees around it, there's very strong natural regeneration. So they generally don't even have to, to replant. So you can see this shows just two years later, uh, this is just all natural regeneration. You've already got pine trees, you know, which are a few feet tall there. And they come right back up. You know, trees have this great trick of uh, being able to, to grow back. Uh, and so, yeah, it's very important uh, that there's land use zoning. Uh, they have conservation areas where they don't do any logging. These are generally more remote areas or areas which are dominated by oak forests because there's not good markets for oak in Mexico. And so this just gives some of the numbers. So that's you know, over half a million total acres of which 421,000 are forested. If there's one more graph here, uh, 18 out of the 23 communities you have, have over 70% forest cover. And so that's between for production forest and conserved forest. Like I said, the production forest uh, are maintained in a lot of uh, forest cover. Let's just keep moving here. So after over a 20-year period, uh, we documented that they have taken out three, nearly 3 million cubic meters of timber from these forests. And this is a Google Earth image of those forests. And what do you see? Lots of forests. So it's really a remarkable story of sustain, sustained yield, sustainable forest management. And you know, the, this is all done under forest management plans, which are, which are required by the Mexican government. And so as part of that, there's an authorized annual cut. But many of the, so they said you can, so you can cut up to you know, 10,000 cubic meters from your forest this year based on the forest growth. Many of these communities, almost more than half, 10 out of the 19, make the conscious decision, okay, you know, the management plan says we can safely and sustainably log 10,000 uh, cubic meters, but you know we're not so sure. We're going to be we want to be careful here, and so they might just log seven or eight thousand, just because they want they want to save these forests for the long term for their children. So they make conscious comfort, uh, commitments to uh, uh, to conserve. Uh, they provide good paying jobs. CFEs have been found to be profitable at all levels of vertical integration. Uh, they provide thousands of well-paying jobs, uh, including uh, retirement and health benefits, which are extremely rare in rural Mexico. Uh, my colleague Juan Manuel Torres Rojo has also documented poverty allevi alleviation uh, compacts, um, poverty alleviation impacts. Uh, so, yeah, so it's finishing up here on climate change. Uh, uh, anybody know what the difference between adaptation and mitigation to climate change? Oh, adaptation. What's the difference? Okay. Uh, adaptation just you know, means, okay, climate change is coming, it's happening, so we have to adapt. We have to build seawalls. We have to, in Florida, we have to build houses which can, you know, resist storm surges and high winds. So that's an adaptation that's happening, and we have to adjust. Mitigation is where we actually are, we refers to the need to reduce emissions, to reduce the extent to which climate change is happening and will happen. That's mitigation. So first of all, I, was, I propose that Mexican CFEs uh, are an adaptation uh, to climate change. Uh, in 2018, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is who issues these reports every four or five years, telling us just how bad it's getting. In a 2018 report, uh, they suggested on forest in particular that we need to do these things, and you can read them. Uh, and they mentioned community-based adaptation, uh, but they did not mention uh, the specific, uh, and this is you know one of the things I talk about in my article in the conversation in the book, uh, that. Mexican CFEs, I argue, are an overlooked and still too little known pre-adaptation to climate change. They're maintaining forests over the long term, which are continuing to uh, 
to sequester carbon and capture carbon. So, for example, there's a lot of concern about what's going on in the Amazon, uh, that the Amazon forest may be near what's called a tipping point. There's still Amazon, a lot of Amazon forest left. It's only, I think, now around 20% deforested. But, there's, uh, but under the current Brazilian president, that rates of deforestation have gone back up. And there's concerns in particular areas that could reach a tipping point where the deforestation would, just, would become linear and be, would become very serious. Uh, yeah, I suggest that Mexican community forests are nowhere near a tipping point. They're very stable in the current conditions uh, where they are. Uh, so Mexico actually has the fifth largest carbon storage globally uh, in what's called the, the voluntary carbon market. I won't go into that for time reasons exactly what that is, but it's there are actually some experiences in Sierra Norte which are offsetting the carbon emissions of the town, the city, Palo Alto, California, where Stanford is, of course, the Walt Disney Company, Duke University, and some others. And more on this in just a minute, sustainably managed forests store more carbon than protected forest. forest. How is that? Well, it, because it turns out when you harvest forests, and when the, so they're not being burned down for agriculture now, right, where the, where the uh, emissions are just going right back into the atmosphere. Uh, they are, uh, <clears throat> when the harvested forests go into things like furniture and houses, you are also storing carbon for the long term. So you're both harvesting timber and carbon, which goes into long term term story, which is called the slow pool uh, of carbon. So that's why sustainably managed forests actually capture more carbon than a forest that you've just got protected, which is growing, which is capturing carbon. But here you're cutting down trees, you're storing the carbon, and you're out allowing for new growth, trees that as they grow are going to be capturing uh, even more carbon. So. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to overdo the good news here, but this is a good news story from from rural Mexico. But there's also lots of one of the I said the single most for, single most important problem that they have now is organized crime in Mexico, which if you pay any attention at all, you've heard about. It's also affecting these enterprises all the way from them having to pay protection money to be able to continue to operate uh, to, up to and including with you know, people within the community who are uh, crooked, collaborating with organized crime. There's even been a few cases of organized crime actually taking over the community forest enterprise and siphoning off the profit. So it's, so it's a very serious problem. Uh, it doesn't, you know, doesn't negate the, the model, it's, but it's a, you know, it's a failure of the Mexican government, the Mexican state. Uh, to be able to control the organized crime. There's, also, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of problems with inefficiencies, with uh, you know, you know, you a, lot of, a lot of attention to the inefficiencies of the community forest enterprise. They're very inefficient and associated issues with that. But they've continued to operate over decades. So yeah, just very quickly to finish up. So it's my, so, yeah, uh, final audience participation here. Does anybody know what this term, the Anthropocene, refers to? The age in which humans are impacting climate. Right. Well, at, uh, right. Um, yeah. What the, what it's the, what's going on here is the current geological era for for geologists is the, called the Holocene, and it, it just describes the area the the era since. Uh, the end of the last glacial period. So basically the last 10 to 12,000 years and the rise of agriculture. Um, but since human beings are now having such a enormous impact on the planet, you know, we're changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. In places like Oklahoma, we're causing earthquakes because of fracking. So all these things, all these impacts that were just thought to be in the hands of God, if you were a religious person, or natural processes which we, can, we couldn't, we could not control, we are now causing and not controlling them very well. So it's a, it's a specific scientific proposal of the geological community that we rename the, cur the current period the Anthropocene. Uh, so, but the current debate is okay. 
fine. We're in the Anthropocene. When did it start? So that's the debate that geologists are having now. And there's, there's a bunch of different proposals, but they're just about uh, to come out with, uh, I think, soon. This has been going on for quite a few years. Yeah, so there's a definition of the anth Anthropocene. But it's, yeah, it's generally very negative in its connotations. But the proposal of a good Anthropocene mm -hmm. is that we're just, you know, we're now being very bad planetary managers. But we have the information and we have the possibility of becoming good planetary managers. And so the idea of a good Anthropocene, where we put the planet on a sustainable path, yeah, it's a, it's a def definition there uh, that you can read. And so my proposal is that Mexican community forest enterprises are among the seas of a good Anthropocene. And I'm sorry I went a little long. I think this was Thank you so much for such an enlightening talk and an inspiring and heartwarming talk in the end as well, too. It's not often we hear good stories. So now we have some time, um, about 25 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, I think if we could just repeat the questions, that will help people online. Um, when I was in Mexico, we were hoping that Lopez Obrador would be finally elected. Yes. And now that he has been, how's he doing? Okay. Yeah, that's well, that's a, yeah, the question was how is the, the current president AMLO, he's called and what Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, how's he doing? Um, that's a very complicated question. You get lots of different opinions on this. My my wife who's a Mexican is what's called an AMLOver. She's a <laughs> she's a she's a huge uh, fan of, of AMLO's um, it's very complicated, um, but let me just say on Forrest in particular, the subject, I think he's, his, one of his signature programs is one called, is called Sembrando Vida, Planting Life, and it's a tree planting program of agroforestry. It's been controversial, is it really effective? He has not particularly supported this sector of community forest enterprises, which I would argue is really unique to Mexico. Lots of people are doing tree planting. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's complicated. I, I personally think Mexico, let me say he's, he's, he's definitely done, had some very serious useful impacts in corruption. Corruption in the Mexican government is definitely, and that was one of his major campaign pledges, reduce corruption and corruption, ha and the government has been reduced. Um, but I think yeah, there's a lot of there's other issues there. I don't think he, I think I still think Mexico deserves better. And, I, and actually, uh, the current foreign secretary of Mexico, a guy named uh, Marcelo Ebrard, is considered who's in the same party, the Morena party, is considered to be his most likely successor. And I I personally I, I'm, I'm a Marcelo Ebrard fan. I think he. Maybe a more interesting Mexican president than, than I'm one. Thank you. I have a question online. If we could ask oh, that. Wait, question. So, this question is for me from Tatiana Schreiber. And she writes A question might be whether Dr. Bray thinks the historic communal ownership combined with cultural values in some of the communities contribute to that careful management for the long term health of the forest that he points out is currently occurring. For example, I'm asking about the role of these values concerning communal responsibilities in this type of forest man management. It seems to be such a stumbling block here in the US and in the Northeast that those values are not widely held. Yeah, that's a very good question and a uh, yeah, very interesting question because there's a variety of experiences. There are in Mexico and some place like the, and a lot of the, most, all of the Sierra Norte, these are indigenous communities, Zapotec indigenous communities, and indeed they had pre-existing communal values which helped them a lot. 
uh, in, in coming together, collective action uh, to, to manage these forests. But what's really interesting for me is, and I, I go into this in, in the book, there's also cases in Mexico where you had very, you know, communities who were not indigenous communities, communities of disorganized goat herders who were given through this agrarian reform process uh, forest lands. And I said this, you know, this opportunity which they were given and to manage a forest together requires collective action. So you actually you also have examples of you know, communities that did not have traditional communal values, uh, but who came together in collective action when they were given these, these valuable forests. And so communal values were actually created through the collective action process in managing these forests. Yeah, Lisa, and then up here. Um, I know that you've been to China. I know China has been doing a lot to, to um, preserve their forests. At least that's my perception. So can you give us a little... Um, yeah, the, the question is, what is, what is China? Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I mean, uh, because, okay, you got communist government, right? Uh, but they know in, in, in forest management, they've actually gone... And it, it's, really, you know, it's really complicated because uh, they've also, the Chinese government has also given provincial governments a lot of leeway in doing different kinds of experimentation, in this case specifically with forest management. So you get different, and I haven't, you know, there have been times when I've gotten to, you know, semi-grip on it, but, but it's very complicated. But in general, they have actually know, they've gone to private ownership and private management Again, there's, there's been cycles of this in, in China, but most recently, they are, they are not encouraging common property forest management. They are going for individual, property forest managed by individuals. Yeah, I mean, it's just one of these really contradictory things. Yeah, either one of you. Uh, most concerning is uh, the uh, <clears throat> climate change and global warming and the droughts right. that could uh, affect forests in a very negative way. I, I, and I'm concerned about that. Do you have comments on that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's a big problem. Uh, uh, no, and as I, as I, as I said, uh, you know, just focusing on, on forest, yeah, tree planting is important because trees, as they grow, you know, you suck, you know, there's a natural climate solution, but as I said, they just, they, you know, somebody has to take care of those trees. Uh, and yeah, here in here in New England and in Vermont, uh, you know, we're doing our part by preserving forests. And yes, even though, uh, yeah, the, I mean, these are all, as you all know, these are all secondary, maturing secondary forests in Vermont. Uh, but by you know continuing to grow, they're capturing carbon. So New England is a very important carbon sink, uh, and it's all also conserving a lot of biodiversity. You've got you know, moose and black bear coming back into Massachusetts and southern New England. They've been in, in uh, Vermont for a long time, I know, but uh, uh, yes, yeah, so I said, yeah, forests are a very important tool for combating climate change, and New England is doing its part, particularly Vermont. Yeah, here, and then. I, I just wanted to add, uh, not exactly a question, but uh, 60 years ago, I visited a sawmill uh, in northern Wisconsin, which was an Indian reservation. The Menominee? And very, very successful yeah. forest management by yes. that tribe. Yes. And everybody's home is just a place on the land. Uh, they have to be in the tribe. And, and back in the mid-50s, I was just amazed that in those days, every member of the tribe got about $11,000 at the end of each uh -huh. year. So they were actually uh, very wealthy compared with what I'd always thought the Indian population of the United States was. Doing. There's a number of Indian reservations in the United States. That was, that was the, I assume that was the Menominee yes. uh, Indian Reservation, Northern Wisconsin. I've unfortunately never been there, but there's a literature on it. Yeah, it's, it's quite, it, quite historic. I mean, it goes, it goes yes. way back. The Navajo are also managing their forests. There's a number of, of uh, Indian tribes in the Northwest that are also sustainably managed by forests. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's happening. And, happening and it's still going on. Yeah, absolutely, it's still going on. Yeah. Back there. Talking about climate change before. Right. 
has the, um, have you noticed yet species migrating north, mm -hmm. that the composition of the forest is changing in, uh, are the, when the replanting is going on, is it, is it too soon for that to happen where, where it, the, your mm -hmm. forest is going to look very different? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it hasn't happened here yet. They, they talk about it's going to happen, but uh, is that um, happening? I mean, I have a second unrelated question. Is, has this model been, has anybody tried to replicate it in other countries um, directly because of this model? Right. Uh, yeah, the, the first question, yeah, very good question. And uh, yeah, there's some Mexican forest ecologists who've been looking at that, and they have, they have proposed that, uh, yeah, that their species composition is going to be moving uphill as, as it gets warmer. And uh, there's a particular, one of the most important commercial pine species in Mexico is called Pinus patula. And yeah, they're proposing that, and they actually did some experiments where they did reforestation plantings of, of, of Pinus patula just above the current, uh, you know, its current range to try to see if it will start growing well at the higher ranges, and apparently it did. And I actually, this, this, is, this is in my book, I asked a, a forest, the forester, the forest management guy in charge in this community of Ixlan de Juarez, I said, so what's, what's happening with, with Pinus patula? And he said, no, right now we're not seeing any impact. It's, it's growing well, both at lower elevations and higher elevations. So it did this very, yeah, so far in the Sierra Norte in particular, they don't appear to be having any problem uh, with that in, in there. But yeah, there's forest ecologists who are aware of it and who have <coughs> proposed to start migrating species, yeah, migrating uphill. Uh, the second one in terms of model, yeah, there are some other examples. Uh, they're all much smaller or not nearly as well documented as, as Mexico, but in the Paten of Guatemala, uh, which is the uh, northern Guatemala, the tropic, lowland tropical forest there, there's a number it's a, it's, a, it's a somewhat different model, I won't go into it, but uh, yeah, where there's been success, much smaller than Mexico, but where there's also been success. success. Bolivia uh, is another example, there's some success, but it's, it's difficult because this, what this requires is that governments turn over the forest to the local communities. And most governments who, who haven't already done that don't want to do it. I mean, the most extreme example is India, where 97% 97, 97 of the forest of India belong to the government. And there was actually new legislation in India just uh, uh, in recent, like 2017 or something, 2017, or a little earlier, 2013, along in there somewhere, where in the legislation, it was actually, you know, measures in there that were devolved more forest management to local communities. But you have this very powerful forest bureaucracy in India, which you know, which has always, you know, came out of the colonial period. They never, India never changed the model of forest management from the colonial period. So they said, you know, we'll keep all these forests. And that forest agency is now so powerful, they basically just stalled on implementing any of the legislation. No, oh, these, these forests are still ours. So, yeah, so the, the biggest problem is governments don't want to devolve responsibility and ownership of these forests over to local communities. So one of the things, like I noticed just in my own community of Marlboro, you know, where we had, you know, selective deforestation, whatever, that's part of, you know, the laws in Vermont, if you get tax deductions on your land, it has to be land that's in use. Uh -huh. Right, so there's this cycle where you need to go in and do some deforestation, you know, some sustainable, you know, whatever, cutting, right? But my concern is the animals, right? The wild animals. Uh -huh. So even though, and the slide also is showing how when you cut things down, they grow back, they can be absorbing more carbon. Mm. But what does that do to the native animals that mm -hmm. used to live there? And how does, like, I'm looking at, like, how do you value an old growth forest where it's actually more valuable to be young growth? Mm -hmm. And then what happens to the, the ecosystems that are dependent on those older mm -hmm. forests? Right. Yeah. No, but they're, yeah, they're in, in these yeah. cases, they're just, yes, they're, they're logging in, uh, in, in, they're logging in, I said, very small areas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they may have a 10,000 hectare forest. So in any given logging period, when they go through these 10-year logging cycles, they may only be logging in 
a thousand hectares of those ten thousand of those ten thousand hectares. Mm -hmm. So then they leave that thousand hectares that was logged, it's, it'll be left alone for up to 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so not only is the forest growing back, but you know the animals can come back, the, you know, there's not going to be any more disturbance from logging there for a sustained period of time. And you know, particularly the, the larger communities, and some of these have, Ixlan de Juarez has almost 20,000 hectares, so that's like 50,000 acres. Mm -hmm. And so they have, they have some areas uh, they, in fact, they have a lowland tropical area, which is about 7,000 hectares, so that's, that's maybe, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, 17, 18,000 acres, which is entirely protected. Mm -hmm. They don't go there. They don't do anything with it. So it's like, it's like a community park. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some other communities, so, so they, particularly the larger communities, are also just conserving large areas of their forest. Mm -hmm. So no, there's not there's not much impact on, and yes, there's been research that suggests that lightly logged, carefully logged forests like that uh -huh. have low impact on biodiversity. Now you probably have new biodiversity that opens up from those, you know, more light coming in, whatever, right? Different kinds of plants can get started. Yeah, well, but as well, you know, a a, a forest that has more areas of secondary. If you just have solid blocks of mature forest, yeah. you have less biodiversity than you right. have yeah. in forests which yeah. have areas of secondary succession, yeah. recently logged areas because there's lots of, there's lots of species, animal species, yeah. bird species, which don't like mature forests. Mm -hmm. They like secondary succession, that's, mm -hmm. that's their habitat. Yeah. And so, uh, just like in, in Massachusetts uh, with the bobolink, uh, in, uh, the bobolink was extremely common bird it, when it, Massachusetts was very heavily deforested in the 19th mm -hmm. century, and there was lots of secondary succession in the past year, the bobolink was one of the most common birds. There's now programs in Massachusetts which try to create secondary succession mm -hmm. because the bobolink is becoming much rarer in Massachusetts. So they, and because it's, it's a species that likes secondary succession. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like mature forest. Yeah. So I have another question from online yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a conflict between, this is also from Tatiana, between conservationists who want to uh, impose protected areas versus others who support human integrated management. So she's curious how that conflict is playing out in Mexico today. Is it one trend or another entity? Right, yeah, so you're talking about uh, you know, beyond just the community forest. Um, I think it's similar in Mexico. I mean, there's Mexican, Mexico has some of the most, has a number of uh, ecologists who are internationally prominent. Uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Rodolfo Dirza, was, was, was stolen by Stanford from Mexico's National University a number of years ago. Uh, just to give you an idea of their, of their quality. And, I mean, it's been interesting. Some of them, some, my, my wife is a forest ecologist, uh, uh, so I also you know, hear about the Mexican ecologist seen from her. And there's certainly schools of thought in Mexico which are strict conservationists, which only believe in protected areas, even though it, you know, in Mexico it's much more difficult because so many of the forest areas are inhabited. But uh, many of them are coming around. I mean, Rodolfo Dirso is actually a, a good example because my, he was a professor of my wife's at uh, UNAM, and she said, you know, back 20 years ago when she was studying with him, he's very strict very strict conservationist, uh, very strict conservationist. Um, but he's really come around over the years and now understands the value of human uh, inhabitants and managing biodiversity. So yeah, it's similar in Mexico, some of the same debates uh, play out as, as, it else, as elsewhere. What form of organization or government is common in these sorts of community forest enterprises or community forest um, management and if um, you spoke a little bit to the indigenous groups but whether it's indigenous or non is there any like are they uh, managed overall by forms of local government that we would be familiar with or yeah. have elements you know that yeah that's, that's similar that's very interesting stuff here to not go into uh, the, the term of art you know in Austrian circles is, is governance you know what is the governance of, of these communities and yeah, it, it's complicated, but uh, uh, 
out of the Mexican agrarian reform, there came specific forms of community governance. I used the term there somewhere, the comisariado. Uh, okay, there's a community assembly, all legal members of the community, and that's defined by the, com by the community and by agrarian reform law, who is a legal member of the community. Form the community assembly. The community assembly votes every three years for their their elected representatives, and it's called the comisariado. It's president, secretary, treasurer, and there's some other. You know, it's called a, a, a consejo de vigilancia, vigilance council. But yeah, it's basically elected uh, govern elected community governance authorities. Testing one two three testing. That's a lot working. Uh, <laughs> Um, elected every three years. Now, those, you know, that was, that governance system was not designed to manage an enterprise. You know, it was just designed to manage community affairs in the community territory, uh, but without, uh, not so already. <laughs> but without, um, so it's been a real, Problem because some of these community forest enterprises run very large and complicated, uh, and so you know the comisariado may not have any experience in business management and forest management, and so it's been a difficult transition for some of these communities, where they make the transition to having professional managers of the community forest enterprise, where it's not just the elected official who's administering the enterprise as a professional manager. Now, what's helped, because of all these years of relative prosperity, people, and I, I did mention this once, people have gotten more education. So in a number of cases, that professional manager is now somebody from the community who got a professional degree. Uh, because in, in earlier cases, where they just had to you know, hire a professional manager from outside, that was difficult for them because it's a trust issue. They really trust somebody from outside you know, to manage their forest enterprise. So it could be like the, the town governments we have, just having another department and hiring exactly. some managers. Exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. Not there's, too unlike that. And, and, but there's, they've got organizational charts. Yeah, this is this is how this is this is the community governments. This is the enterprise governments. This is how they relate. Yeah, yeah. Do you any reason for optimism then, as far as Mexico being a narco state? Oh, you, yeah. you hear about. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You hear about it's the most dangerous place in the world right now for journalists. That's, that's, that's absolutely true. That, that's one of the areas where I would fault AMLO. AMLO is not, you know, he, is, he has continued to criticize journalists in a country that has the highest rate of assassination of journalists in the, in the world. And yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't look good, you know, to do that. You know, he doesn't, he's, he's like, I should also, he continues to be very popular. He's got like 60% popularity. Because uh, he's still got this populist <coughs> image, uh, but yeah, the narco. Well, that's, not, that's another. He. It's a, It's the. You know. It's the problem from hell for any Mexican government. Uh, is it getting no, worse, or is it getting worse, or is it sort of stable? It's getting worse. I'm not sure. It's got, right now. I'm not sure it's getting worse. But it's bad yeah. and, uh, and not getting any better. Right. Um, it's it's very much confined to particular parts of the country, uh, places like Chihuahua. Pretty, it's more in the northern states. Oaxaca, state of Oaxaca, is is pretty peaceful. I mean, what what what's said is that when one cartel completely controls a region, uh, you know that it's that it's peaceful because they you know they got everything under control. Well, you know, the, the state of Oaxaca apparently is most, there's some growing of marijuana. Um, Mex the Mexican government does appear to be slowly, I don't know what's taking them so long, moving towards legalization of marijuana. Uh, so that, you know, that'll, that'll help. But they're also, you know, they're, they're also, you know, they're manufacturing fentanyl, they're diversifying, you know, kidnapping, taking over community forest enterprises. Now, there was the Washington Post uh, a couple of years ago had an estimate that the Mexican government does not control like 20% of the territory of Mexico. You know, like, you know, the, I wouldn't be surprised if it's somewhat more than that. It's under, basically under the control of organized crime. And, you know, they've tried different things. The president Calderon, who was the president 2006-2012, tried to use the military. Uh, that didn't work. 
AMLO tried created what he called the National Guard. That hasn't worked. Uh, he's now folding the National Guard. And he's actually, AMLO is actually moving toward what in fact is kind of strategy the Calderon years. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Calderon, the Playboy soap opera guy? Excuse me? Calderon, wasn't he the Playboy soap opera guy? No. I, I, no, not even a Playboy. I don't hear that. <laughs> oh, no, you're thinking of Peña Nieto, who's, yeah. who, who's, whose wife was, uh, was a soap opera star, yes. Right. Well, right. I just feel like AMLO came into such a disaster after someone like Peña Nieto. Yeah, yeah, with very, with very high corruption. Yeah, I, apparently, the, you know, one thing he has done, which he can't be criticized for, he has controlled corruption, but you know, so I think there's a lot of other issues. No, yeah, so what's gonna, where's that going to go? What's going to happen? I, you know, there, there doesn't appear to be any solution to it. It's not, yeah, it's not getting any better. So, no, it's a very serious problem for the Mexican government. Do those, um, do the local community forest um, groups have enough autonomy to, say, um, reintroduce extirpated animal species? Reintroductions? Uh, yeah, yeah, they would. Yeah, I mean, they <laughs> without having to get the feds. They have, they have, they have a lot of you know economic and political autonomy. Actually, I understood that uh, uh, there was a there was one of the forest managers in Ixlan de Juarez. I don't think anything happened with this. I, I'm sure it would be very controversial, but they were. He was apparently talking about the idea of reintroducing the Mexican wolf to Sierra Norte, which disappeared you know, a long time ago. I think, like in the U.S. West, uh, I'm sure that a lot of the communities would not be excited about this. Uh, but uh, but no, they they do a lot of uh, the, the the thing with jaguars. There's um, yeah, uh, they uh, they have a number of the communities are certainly tolerating jaguars. And, uh, well, in hunting. And in, in most of these, you know, relatively prosperous forest communities, they've they've prohibited hunting. They don't they don't need they don't need to hunt anymore. And so that's another measure which has been you know very positive for wildlife. Um, and they and they they're they're taking measures to protect the jaguars. You know, I mean, there's no hunting of jaguars. Um, they've you know there's not most of, many of these communities don't have any livestock, so that helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, thank you very okay. much. Thanks, uh, thanks all of you for your interest in the questions. I wanted to mention just to closing that aside from being a new kind of part-time member of our community, um, Dr. Bray will be speaking at the high school as part of the Peace Jam. Um, Activity that was started by one of our October board 19th was the date. Yeah, so I didn't hear that. What what on the 19th? He'll be speaking at uh, for Peace Jam, which is at the high school, where we're bringing different um, individuals and speakers to come and contribute to um, the high school education. So he'll he'll be one of those speakers. Ooh, Could you good. talk a little bit more about the Peace Jam and how that got started? Is listed so, here? Yeah, okay. so Peace Jam, I'm also working with Peace Jam. Hi, I'm Tamara Sten. So I teach at Landmark College. Yes. Um, I'm also on the board of Wyndham World Affairs. And so what we've done is we're working with this nonprofit organization called Peace Jam that's put together by the different Nobel laureates around the world, including Jody Williams, who lives right here in Putney. And we work with local um, students, so high school, college, in identifying billion acts of peace, one billion acts of peace. And we're looking at different areas where youth can get involved to build education, make a difference, speak out, bring awareness, become allies, become um, advocates for different places of change. Okay? So it's, it's, it, and it can happen in many different areas. So the high school is very focused on environmental issues. So that's something that David's presentation is going to be really inspirational for them. Great. Did I understand that that got kicked off last spring? <laughs> that did. Yeah, oh, like I kicked off last spring. I was trying to figure out that connection. Yeah. yeah. So we have a curriculum. I'm using the curriculum with my 36 um, communication students. Oh. And what they're working on now is they're putting together poster presentations. We'll have 36 different types of topics. And then the Billion Acts of Peace, which is a project that was started through Google, will be able to um, showcase the different posters 
right, and start creating more awareness around the different aspects that my students are bringing to these different topics, everything from like nuclear proliferation to um, inclusion of neurodiversity when we're looking at, at justice issues to, um, what are they looking at, um, child slavery, you know, women's rights, trafficking. So and all of those different issues are going to be working. Will be making those posters available? Yeah, we will be making them. So their due date is November 9th. So this oh, yeah. month they're starting to work on it. They just learned how to research the projects in the library, you know, getting new Great. data from different databases. Great. So all different ways. And then the high school has a, has a program where they have extracurricular activities. So the students are working together more as an independent group as well to start bringing awareness to the areas that they're interested in. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a really, it's an international organization, so Peace Jam is part, we're part of Peace Jam, so we're like coordinated with people from all over the world working in